hearts and faith and love and worship today. We welcome everyone who is joining us for in-person worship here at the church and also for those who are joining us online. A hearty welcome to you from Knox St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Dutton. A few announcements before we uh, continue our worship. Um, there, uh, the tr if you've noticed, uh, maybe if you're, especially if you're doing need transfers, giving, the church email has changed. So make note if you want to know what that church email is, uh, you can visit our website and you can find that information. And that'll, again, especially important for those who are doing e transfers um, through that system. Uh, as well, uh, we are excited to uh, uh, mention and, and uh, celebrate the, the birthday of Kathy Average. Which is, is it tomorrow that you're celebrating? Uh, 60 years. A big, big birthday for <laughs> Kathy Average. So uh, make sure you wish her well. And uh, so glad to celebrate that special milestone with you. Okay. Uh, one last announcement on white. Uh, uh, Linda Ford to come up and share that announcement with you. I'm going to turn on this mic for you here. So. Good morning, everybody. Um, just actually two announcements. The first one, a quick one. A pair of what I believe ladies' black gloves were found outside near a green car. So if somebody's looking for these gloves, I'll put them at the table at the back for when you leave. And um, we all know that singing and music has always been a very important part of our, our service. And pre-COVID, it was something that we thoroughly enjoyed. So we just wanted to take this uh, moment to remind everybody that it is very important that we refrain from singing. And as we've mentioned, please take the time of music as a reflective time as you're reading the words of the hymns. Um, Southwest Public Health has proven medically that when we sing, droplets do come out with a stronger force, and they are, it is possible for them to go past our mass. So in everybody's best interest in health, we just ask and remind everybody to refrain from singing during the music. to worship from the psalmist. Uh, the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. We worship the Lord together as we sing our first hymn, Will You Come and Follow Me? Number 634. Lord, 
pray. Lord, here we are. Another week has passed. We have come back to this place together with one another in unity to seek your face, to draw support from you and one another. Lord, you are our source and our strength. You give us guidance when needing direction. You cover us and guide us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We come today confessing our sins. We bring before you our mistakes, our failures, the times we have disobeyed your voice and decided not to listen. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your sacrifice through Jesus Christ that has canceled the punishment and the accusation that were against us. Forgive us, Lord, now. Wash us clean through your blood that will never lose its power. Help us to stand confident in your forgiveness and in your grace. In your gracious name we pray. Amen. Amen. We now present our offerings to God. Gracious Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to give back to you what you have shared with us, all the resources, the talents, the time. Lord, receive these things for your honor and your glory, and we ask that you would multiply them, bless them, so that they will um, reach out to others with your kindness, and your love, and your generosity. Oh God, we love you and we praise your name. Amen. Let us uh, join and sing our, our next hymn, hymn number 449, Lord, listen to your children pray.
scripture reading is from uh, Thessalonians chapter 5. 1st uh, Thessalonians chapter 5. We're all getting used to these protocols, aren't we? And throughout the, the singing, I've been inviting you to sing, but I'm, <laughs> I think it's just part of my language in church, and i got to re-examine those languages. So sorry if, uh, for mixed messages when we're asking you not to refrain from singing, and I'm asking you to sing. So I know we, we talked about that uh, holy humming, and uh, we'll continue with that. So reading from Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons and daughters of the light and sons and daughters of the day, we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not, like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Our gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 25. Last week we looked at the, the first part of the chapter, the parable of the uh, ten bridesmaids, and now we're looking at the parable of the talents in the same chapter. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I had not sown and gathered where I had not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put the money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received back what I had with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the other, to, to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, 
for there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, uh, we thank you again for your word. It's uh, disturbing to us at times, Lord. Father, we pray that you would take it and take your word to challenge us today, to encourage us, to lift us up in these difficult times. Lord, we need your love. We need your grace in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a little boy in elementary school, I would look forward to recess along with so many others, especially during the fall. As soon as the bell rang, I, along with my friends, would race to gather under the boughs of this giant oak in front of our school. We would be there to collect as many acorns as we could fit into our small pockets. I remember taking these acorns home and then dumping them into a large garbage bag, which I would eventually fill at the end of the season. And then I began to count every single one of those acorns, making special note of the biggest ones. And I did this so I could go back to school the following day and I could report to my friends that I had more acorns than any of them. What I remember most about this time and about that great oak tree was that it always had more than enough acorns for all of us to spare. There was plenty there was plenty enough for us, there was plenty enough for the squirrels, and there was plenty enough for the school lawnmower that eventually went over. I was sad uh, when I returned to that school 30 years later to find that great oak tree was gone, but the memories of abundance still remained with me until now. In an article, Look to the Acorns, the writer Reagan Sutterfield says this, I know of no better example of abundance than an acorn. In a mass year occurring every two to five years in the, in the forest cycle, a mature oak tree can produce 10,000 acorns. <clears throat> Viewed from the perspective of continuing the life of its kind, this seems excessive. And yet it follows a pattern not uncommon in nature, a pattern that cycles through many periods of more than enough. Sutterfield says, like other realities of creation, the life of an oak tree is one that gives way to other life, multiplying exponentially. Not only that, it supports many other lives than those of seedling oaks. Acorns mean more squirrels and more mice, which can mean more hawks and owls. The abundance moves and spreads, creating an economy of enough for the whole of the forest. Well, this is the kind of economy that Jesus prays in his Sermon on the Mount when he told us to look at the birds who don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And yet Sutterfield also says how different from this economy of abundant sharing is the example that we see in our parable today. The parable uh, that we're looking at in Matthew chapter 25 where we encounter a master who not only reaps and sows but reaps where he did not sow and gathered seeds where he did not scatter seed. How true are those words. When you look seriously at this parable, on the surface, it seems that the landowner, who most commentators say is a standard for God, looks the opposite of someone who is generous. He entrusts his resources to three of his servants while he is away on a long journey. The first two take the talents that were entrusted to them. They both invest the money and it grows and doubles. And upon the landowner's return, we're told that they are commended and rewarded for, with greater responsibility. But then there's the third servant. Instead of putting the money into high-risk investments like the others, he cautiously puts the money in a safe place where he will find it again. And the story turns on this last servant. The landowner, upon his return, finds that the 
The third servant didn't do anything with the talent given to him. The master thinks he has squandered it. And the last we find him, the servant is being sentenced to a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in outer darkness. After excluding this last servant and throwing him into outer darkness, I, I begin to feel for this servant. He almost can agree with him, with his estimation of the wealthy landowner. He says about him, I knew you were a hard man, so I was afraid, so I hid your money. If the wealthy landowner is a stand-in for God here, then his calculated demand for a high return on his investments resulting in judgment seems to be a very de negative depiction of God. Admittingly, this take on the story as well might make for good church stewardship campaigns, especially during these difficult times of COVID when many churches are looking for a financial boost, but we have to be careful. As another writer, Matt Skinner says, we must not adopt the parable's economic symbolism too easily. For too long, this parable has been taken as a story that gives divine approval to the idea that ingenuity must be the cause of all economic growth, while those who endure economic stagnation must be lazy. The implied story in this interpretation is invest, grow, and succeed. But we miss the point entirely if we think that this parable is all about money. The key to understanding this parable and the landowner's generosity lies in what he gives the servants. You see, they were all given talents. And the Greek word for talent here is talenton, and it refers to roughly 30 pounds of gold. We're talking about extraordinary amounts of money, a little under a million dollars in today's gold prices. One talent would be roughly equivalent to 20 years of wages for the average worker in that day. The writer Skinner says the sheer plot of the parable, the mention of a man entrusting large gold blocks whether five, two, or one of them, to the enslaved members of his household, must have made Jesus' followers laugh out loud when they heard it. No one does that, not in their corner of the world. But that extravagance that destroys the plausibility of Jesus' story is a hint. It tells us what the parable is about. Jesus doesn't send his followers into the world with a morality tale to warn against the evils of laziness. No. This story is about the responsibilities that come with incredible abundance. It's a story about our calling as people of God. When neglecting to bring the valuable talent out into public, the problem is that an opportunity to further the work of Jesus has been squandered. A gift has been disregarded and taken for granted. The one who receives talents, absurdly valuable talents from Jesus, have been given chances. That is extraordinary opportunities to advance the work of God and his blessing to the world. It's about the lavish abundance that God showers on his people. And what do we do with that abundance? Do we squander it? Or do we faithfully steward and share what God has given us? In the film, the Danish film, Babette's Feast, maybe you've uh, heard of it before or watched this film. In the film, a French refugee appears in a coastal village. Two elderly sisters, leaders of the community's religious life, take her in. And for 14 years, Babette works as their housekeeper. When Babette comes into a large sum of money, she invites the congregation of 12 to join her for an extravagant French meal of caviar, quail and puff pastries, and more. And they move from course to course, and the guests begin to relax 
Some find forgiveness in that meal. Some find love rekindled. And some begin to recall miracles that they've witnessed, witnessed and truths they've learned from their childhood. Remember what we were taught, they said. Little children love one another. When the meal ends, Babette reveals to the sisters that she spent all that she had on the food. She gave everything, including any chance of returning to her old life as an acclaimed chef in Paris, just so that her friends eating might feel their hearts open. These first two servants receive their extraordinary gifts and opportunities and like Babette in our film, are not afraid to use it. They know their master, and they have eyes to see all of those opportunities that surround them. They have eyes to see that they too are co-workers in what God, the master, is doing in the world to share that abundance with everyone. But the last servant, Instead of seeing the opportunities around him, he only sees dead ends and despairs the master's response. And we know from his language that he uses to describe the master that he had a distorted image of this master and that somehow shapes the way he lives his life. As a result, his life is one of fear and distrust and his judgment becomes an unfulfilled life in darkness and despair. And if you turn to the next parable in our reading, which is the judgment on the sheep and the goats, we begin to see a counter view of the way one lives before God. A person that recognizes that they are overwhelmed by God's abundance. They live a life of generosity. Without expecting anything in return, they show hospitality to strangers. They care for the sick and the poor. They visit those who are in prison. They redeem the opportunities before them. In short, they are advocates. They are speakers of truth to power and injustice, and they tend to the less fortunate. They seek better ways as well to be stewards of the creation and the environment that God has blessed them with. They don't hide their light, but let it shine. And as they care for the least of these, they learn only afterwards that they are in fact caring for Jesus Christ himself. Sutterfield says, here God shows up first as a beggar before appearing as a wealthy landowner. The beggar God does not call for managers to grow his business in accord with company policy. The game is not how to make best use of resources for the purpose of the owner, but how to give oneself heart, mind, muscles, home to the beggar Lord in love. I love that image. God waits as a beggar in this parable, for our love to be returned to him. When you understand God in this way, as one who appears on earth as a stranger and as a servant who gave everything so that we might experience God's abundance, we realize the great responsibility that comes with that incredible abundance. We awaken to our calling in the world a calling to share love and hope and grace and care because the stakes are incredibly high, especially in these desperate times. When the pandemic has caused a crisis of isolation and an increase of mental problems in society, where economic hardship is on the increase as well, and the cries of equality are not being heard, where the politics of rage and hate are so popular that it's left acting with mercy and justice and afterthought. In times like these, the good news that we all possess is needed more than ever. Advocates for the less fortunate, the hurting in our world and our environment are needed. 
So what will we do with this responsibility? What are the opportunities that we have buried that God wants to bring to light? How shall we live? I want to conclude with the words, again, of Reagan Sutterfield that begins to answer this question. We begin to learn how to live into the ever-moving gifts of this beggar God, not by learning from the patterns of the marketplace where extraction and exploitation are the norm, and scarcity and fear make those who have want to have all the more. Instead, we should look to the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, those who do not reap or sow or toil, but instead live on the daily manna of acorns and seeds and all of the abundance that flows from them. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for all the abundance that you give, especially in this fall season as we turn our eyes to creation, the acorns, the, all the life that comes. Thank you, Lord, for all the colors. We thank you for the harvest. And Lord, we thank you as well for our church family here today and online. Oh God, we have so many things to be thankful for. We thank you especially for the freedom to worship you. The freedom to gather and call upon your name. We thank you for our great country of Canada. For all the liberties and the abundance that we have here. Lord, we also turn our hearts and minds to those who may be in our country that don't have everything, Lord, that we have, or those who don't have enough food or shelter, or, or those who are experiencing challenges in their workplaces or homes. We turn our hearts as well to those in our world, Lord, who are suffering from natural disasters and hurricanes. Philippines and other places, O oh God, that have lost their homes and livelihoods, O oh God, have mercy. Lord, awaken us to the hope that we have in you and fill us with your compassion, Lord. Fill us with your love, O oh Lord, that you would guide our decision-making. And Lord, that you would lead us to act as advocates for your name. Yes, all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us respond to God as we hum our our last hymn, number 324, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.